it's a terrific framework on which to hang uh, a narrative that's always about curiosity. Hi, I'm Matt Welch, Editor-in-Chief of Reason Magazine, and I'm here in Las Vegas with Adam Savage, the co-host of the uh, great show Mythbusters on the Discovery Channel, which has been going on for seven years now? Seven and a half years we've been filming it, yeah. Tell us uh, about the genesis of the show. How did it come to be created, and, uh, and how did it uh, sort of take off like it has? It's, it remains the most startling thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, I was working as a special effects technician in San Francisco uh, in early 2000s, and Jamie Heineman, who I used to work for and remained friendly with, called me up in the spring of 2002 and said that he'd gotten a call from the Discovery Channel, said they were casting a show called Mythbusters. They wanted a couple of guys who were interested in building experiments and testing, uh, testing stuff on a show. And would we send in a demo reel? And would we send in a demo reel the next day? <laughs> and I said, you know, this sounds interesting. And I went in with a video camera and Jamie's assistant, shop assistant, shot about two hours worth of video. What I, did you build and blow up? We actually, uh, we discussed a myth. We discussed the lawn chair Larry myth. They said discuss a myth like the balloon chair guy. So we spent 15 minutes talking about him. Um, and then at one point, I, I know Jamie has a fire cabinet. So I said, let's blow something up. I, if you look at the demo reel now, it looks exactly like the show. Because we're in the same shop, we're in the same space, and we're doing the same stuff. Lighting, the, lighting this uh, you know, bunch of fireworks on a metal stand, and then we run away because it set part of the <laughs> shop on fire. And uh, Discovery went nuts for it. They, they showed up three weeks later. The production company showed up three weeks later to start shooting the pilots. We did uh, three episodes in the summer of 2002. And we haven't stopped shooting since. It's now 171 hours of programming. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you, you had a long sort of career or personal life of building stuff, working in special effects, but had you been interested up until that moment in actually trying to debunk myths and sort of like unbuild things? And No. The, the, the myth part is a scarecrow. Everyone... We always say, nobody's ever emailed us thanking us for the groundbreaking work in urban legend research we're doing. Yeah. Um, I definitely feel at this point we have a real insight into what makes urban legends and great stories propagate. But for the most part, it's a terrific framework on which to hang uh, a narrative that's always about curiosity. It's always about curiosity. And it turns out that the best way to satisfy your curiosity happens to be the scientific method. It happens to be See what you can learn from doing this, build on that to build the next thing. And the scientific method happens fortuitously for us to grid perfectly on top of a narrative arc. And I mean, that's the arc of every episode is we're trying to figure out how something works by continually testing it and building our knowledge on what we've learned before. And we're still thrilled by doing that. In the process of doing that, has it sort of changed your ideas about the propagation of myths or about society and the way people, has it changed your politics in any way? It hasn't changed my politics except to make me more politically active because I realize that I'm a voice that people, that people pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I'm very cognizant now of the role, of the very unexpected role we play in educating children. I mean, we don't pander to kids and we never set out to make a show that was educational, really. I mean, it, we understand that that's what it is, but if we had attempted to do that, we would have failed. Uh, there's a veracity to the fact that we are actually curious about what we're doing that keeps people watching. Um, and we're now getting emails from people saying that they're graduating from college, having grown up watching our show wow. and been inspired to go into the sciences because they watch Mythbusters, which is, I mean, it's humbling and bizarre and amazing and thrilling. Uh, what's the sort of future of this? Are you just going to keep doing it until it, uh, you get bored or they kick you off? The show is still doing fantastically. Um, we are still leading our demo in our time slot on Discovery, on advertising supported cable. After seven years, uh, our viewership stays beautifully, beautifully stable. Um, I, I like to point out that our ratings died during the presidential debates, but didn't budge during game one or game seven of the last World Series. Oh, wow. It's a very specific viewing audience <laughs> type thing. Um, 
And uh, the show's still going strong. We want to, we'll keep doing it until they lock the doors and it doesn't look like there's any end in sight. What are sort of maybe like three categories, uh, if there are three or two or whatever, of, uh, of types of myths that sort of obtain in people's consciousness that you have uh, encountered? Well, I mean, we definitely started out with your kind of laundry list of urban legends, things right. that you would have found on the Darwin Awards or under urban legend sites like Snopes.com or, or The Straight Dope. Uh, but we have branched way out from that, realizing that uh, movie physics, movie, the way movies perceive the world and lead you to believe that every car that goes off a cliff will blow up into a fireball, um, that's very fertile territory. There's idioms, idiomatic phrases like uh, slipping on a banana peel, finding a needle in a haystack. Um, we're just actually looking at doing another one where I want to test uh, wild goose chase. <laughs> I want to see Jamie stealing candy <laughs> from a baby. Um, and then there's, uh, and then there's, then there's the prevailing wisdom about how things work, like the five-second rule, which actually, you know, is one of those things when you start to go look at it, there might be something really interesting there. Is it is that you drop the pacifier on the ground? And, if it's uh, only been there for five seconds, we it's call that the three-second rule in, in your yeah, household. And exactly, it's going down to two in one second. Uh, we just did double dipping, for instance. That just aired, I think, uh, this this last week, and um, we we showed that there was no ill effects from double dipping. The amount of bacteria that you impart back to the salsa by biting a chip and putting it back in negligible. Having worked in effects and sort of being uh, a participant in sort of 21st century technologies and whatnot, do you get the sense that people, because they've done their own photoshopping and, and are, are on the internet, are they, are they given more kind of skeptical tools now? Uh, or is it more that uh, the technology has made it easier to fabricate things? Well, that's a good question. I think, I mean, obviously it's both. I think people are we we're always asked, are you guys running out of material? And I mean, having just sat down and gone over 160 stories, it'll carry us two seasons ahead at least. We're not running out of stories. And we say, we're not gonna run out of stories until people stop believing stupid shit. <laughs> and that's never gonna happen. People are still just as gullible. Uh, and a good story is a good story, and you wanna pass it on even if you're not quite sure it's true. Uh, I like to imagine that the web is providing people with more, well, no, actually, of course the web is providing people with more tools to be skeptical, to, to cross-check their facts. Um, not everyone is doing it, but because the web provides so much information on a first-order retrievability to everybody, uh, people can go and check their facts, and they can go, I mean, honestly, I know that a lot of my fact-checking has to do with just reading the style of the writing I'm reading on a website. Right. I can smell bullshit just by how badly written something is sometimes. It's not necessarily about, you know, that the facts are wrong. Um, how many times they use of course and naturally. And these kinds yes, of or you need to keep an open mind because this is the only interpretation there is for such a thing. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. Uh, uh, we have uh, a, a limited uh, time window on the internet and YouTube and whatnot. So I think we'll wrap up here uh, for Reason TV. Uh, I'm Matt Welch.